What's up guys, Alton from Microgrind and Poker School here back with another video for our YouTube channel and tonight we're going to play some 5 nl zone on Ignition and we're also going to go over one hand that I have saved in my Poker Tracker 4 database that I want to share with you guys. So if you guys want to watch me playing some 5 nl zone on Ignition, stay tuned because that's what we're going to do tonight. Hey guys, welcome to tonight's video. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name's Alton Harden. I'm the founder of Microgrinder Poker School and this YouTube video. And we're all about turning beginning and struggling poker players into solid winning poker players through solid fundamentals. So if you guys are new to this channel, please consider hitting that subscribe button down there in the corner. And if you guys like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Now, for those of you that have been watching my videos, if you like all the free content that I produce here on YouTube, please consider checking out my Patreon account down below in the description because you guys can support this channel for as little as $1 per month and help me to produce more and more free content for you guys. But without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get into tonight's video where I'm going to be playing some 5 nl Zone on Ignition. All right, so let's go ahead, let's get into the content for tonight's video. And we're gonna kick it off with a hand that I played during my last session playing 5 and L zone on Ignition. So the whole point of this hand before we get into it is we're looking at spots to squeeze opponents out. We're playing fast fold poker and people tend to overfold preflop because people tend to be more nitty and more tight in fast fold poker games. So with that said, let's go ahead and let's go through this hand history. So we get a fold from under the gun, middle position open raises to three big blinds, get a call from cutoff, we get a call from the big or from the button as well, and now it's on us in the small blind. And so we have a decision here. Yes, we can flat call here. Flat calling here is perfectly fine because we're getting great pot odds with a decent hand that's going to play well in multi-ways. So that's the upside of this hand, is that we're getting really good pot odds to call here. In fact, our pot odds are 4 to 1, which means we only need 20% equity, which we're definitely going to have with King Jack suited of hearts. Now, the downside, there's two downsides. Number one, we don't know about anybody at this table because this is anonymous speed poker. So... Player five, which is a full stack player in the big blind, if we call, this player could put in a really big three bet squeeze and squeeze us out of the pot. So if they put in a three bet squeeze to roughly around a dollar, there's no way we can call with King Jacks, suited of hearts. And there's no way we'd want to call anyways, um, unless everybody else called and we were forced into calling, which really wouldn't be something we'd want to do anyways. That's the first downside. The second downside is that King Jack suited is easily dominated by a lot of other hands. So if we think about the Kings being dominated, it's dominated by King Queen. It's dominated by Ace King, which is definitely going to be within this opponent's range. And King Queen's going to be within their calling range. If we think about the jack, then we're also dominated by ace jack as well, which is going to be within all their ranges. So with that said, I decide to put in a really large 3-bet squeeze. And in terms of the sizing, it's going to be 3.5x plus 1x for each person. So it should be roughly 5.5x of 3 big blinds. So 15 times 5.5x is 82 cents. I made it just under 5.5x. I made it 80 cents. And the whole point of me making this raise here is that I don't want to get squeezed by the big blind. I also don't want to run into a dominated hand situation. And I'm also playing in the worst position post flop. I'm in the small blind and potentially if he comes along, he doesn't squeeze and I'm out of position to every single other player at the table, which is a horrendous thing to have post flop. The other thing is that there's a huge incentive for me to squeeze here because there's a total of 50 cents, which is potentially dead money in the pot if nobody wants to fight for it pre-flop. So putting in such a large raise here looks really strong. And there's 50 cents in the pot right here that's potentially mine for the taking because people tend to overfold. So I put in a big raise and accordingly, the initial raiser folds and cutoff folds but interesting enough, we get a call from button. So this is what makes this really interesting because 
We expect to get a lot of folds when we pump this up so big at 5 nil zone, but we do get a call from this opponent, which doesn't really make much sense because they're within their overcalling range, which is typically going to be on the weaker side. It shouldn't be that strong, so he shouldn't have hands that can actually profitably call a 3-bet, but he does. And so we go to the heads, we go to, to the flop heads up, which is better than going to the flop three ways or four ways um, or potentially five ways. So the flop is pretty good for us. So remember, we put in a really large three bet. So we're repping a really strong range. It's an eight high board. We have two over cards with the heart flush draw for the second nut flush draw. So realistically, we have a lot of outs for drawing hand equity. We're also repping a really strong range. So accordingly, I put out a bet. I bet 117 into 195. Let's make sure this didn't um, update it. So 117 to 195, just over a half pot size bet. We don't need to make it too big in a three bet pot. And this allows us to shove the turn or the river accordingly, just because the stack sizes are going to be so small comparatively to the pot. So we put in a C bet and our opponent folds. So it got a bit interesting there post flop because we put in a really big three bet. We whiffed out on the flop, except we have a really good draw. So we represent a strong range. We also have a lot of draw in hand equity. And so we continue by C betting on the flop. Now, if our opponent calls, then we really have to reevaluate the turn to determine what type of hands he's calling with. Typically, he's going to have some pocket pairs such as pocket jacks, pocket tens, pocket nines that are going to call this flop. So if we get a complete whiff on the turn, like maybe a two of diamonds, we may have to check the turn. Because at these stakes, people just aren't folding. If we jam all in um, just under a pot size bet on the turn, we may get a call by a small over pair, such as a pair of nines, a pair of tens, or a pair of jacks. Um, but if a heart comes, let's say it's two of hearts, and of course we're going to jam all in because, again, we still get, expect to get called by those hands as well. So anyways, that's the first hand I just wanted to share with you. The post-flop is interesting, but the pre-flop is really the most important part. So I wanted to talk about the reasoning to look for spots like this when you're playing out of position in the small blind in these type of games. These games play a lot differently than what I've been playing um, regularly, really, for the last month or so on Global. It's really like polar opposites in terms of the styles of games and the players in the games. So we're going to go ahead and now let's jump into some live play on Ignition. All right, so I went ahead and I logged into Ignition Casino, and just be forewarned before I get into the live play that I've been having issues with Ignition Casino software. Um, last couple days, I tried to log in both for my laptop and for my desktop, and I couldn't log in to the lobby. It would just sit there and try to log in, and you couldn't, you know, when you log in here before you log in, you can typically see the tables, and you get a pop-up window. It didn't show any of that, so I ended up reinstalling the software again today, and it got it. I got it to work. I just tried logging in a minute ago. It won't work, so I closed out the software, loaded it up again, and now it works. What's telling me that there's potentially some issues is that the 5 and L zone doesn't even have 50 players in the player pool. And I've been seeing on 2 plus 2 that people have had issues with the software. So we'll see what happens. Um, I'm playing with their money anyways that they gave me. So what we're going to do is we're going to load up two tables and hope for the best. And hope that the tables actually load. So let's see what happens. I just loaded up the tables and uh, you're seeing what I'm seeing. You're seeing black tables just like me. So maybe we aren't going to be able to play a zone. Um, let me close them out and try it again. And now they're not even closing. So maybe this video is going to be a Bovada zone or ignition zone fail video because the software isn't working. Um, it looks like it's starting to load. It, it actually shows me having a hand, but I can't see it. Um, that's a crazy thing. So it says I have 8-7 offsuit, um, and Hold'em indicator is actually pulling that hand up here, but it's showing black for me on my screen. So anybody seeing this type of issue, let me know what in the world's going on. I'm actually going to close out everything. I'm going to close out um, zone. I'm going to close out the software and we're going to try 
one more time. So I'm going to pause the video and be back in one second. We're going to try to play one more time. All right, so we're back. Just logged in. We're going to give this one more try. So, so you guys can see everything I'm doing. We're going to click to open one table. And so here's the interesting thing is that I didn't have Hold'em Indicator open this time. So I'm wondering if Hold'em Indicator is causing issues. Um, I am going to open it to see if it does cause issues on a second screen and if it doesn't. So let's go ahead and let's join another table as well. And it looks like it, it didn't actually sit me out on the tables, even though I logged out, out of the software. So it looks like things are kind of buggy with their software. I mean, I closed the software and still kept me on the zone tables. I don't know. Anyways, let's get some play going on. So we're going to fold 8-6 under the gun. I'm going to open Ace-5 suited and cut off. I'm going to try to resize these a little bit. I remember last time I made a video trying to resize these. I had some issues with them sizing a bit too large. We're not going to ISO raise these four off against the complete unknown. So we're just going to muck that hand. And we're not going to open queen nine suited under the gun. And um, looks like the software just froze up on me. Oh, geez. Ignition, ignition, ignition. What's going on here? Um, yeah, I guess people are complaining about all sorts of issues on 2 plus 2. Let's go ahead and pull up 2 plus 2 just to to see what everybody else is going is saying and, and what type of issues people are experiencing. So I'm pulling it up on the other screen and I'm going to bring it over in one second and let's see what everybody else is saying because it looks like the software is super buggy and this is definitely going to be a bit of a fail video. So let's scroll to the bottom. Um, can't log in. Tried uninstalling and reinstalling. Computer did freeze while playing. Let's go back. Lobby not loading. 97% freeze pretty often today. A few hiccups. Software's been running well for the vast majority. Interesting. Freezes very often. It's not working for me either. Intermittent issues, nine uninstalls and reinstalls, still can't load the lobby. Um, yeah, you know what? I really don't know what to say about the software. To be honest, I don't know what's going on. I am going to pause the video. We're going to try one more time. Third time's a charm, right? Third time's a charm. Um, and I'm actually I'm not going to pause the video because that way you guys can see um, if it's going to be a fail or not. So let's try this, guys. Let's try one more time. And maybe I should just reduce my play to one table. I don't know. Um, now it shows over 50 people playing. And let's just try one table. Let's try one table and see if we don't get any freezes on that one table. And we get pocket aces. Let's not freeze with pocket aces. And let's get somebody to open. Maybe one of these shorties will just open jam. I have a feeling it's going to fold all the way around. That's unfortunate. So we're gonna we're not gonna open hold them indicator. We're gonna let this run for a few hands, and then if everything seems to be okay, then I'll open up a second table. So ace jack off, pretty standard open. Um, everything looks like it's running okay. I think it's time for me to open up a second table. Um, this is a bit on the loose side, but let's get some hands in. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's still not bumping in off the tables from earlier. So we have an interesting flush draw. So we do have the nut flush draw one over. Um, we're sandwiched between two opponents. Um, if it the if it checked to me, C betting's fine. Checking back is fine as well. Of course, we're not going to fold. 
with the nut flush draw. And now we also pick up the gutter straight draw to go along with it. So that gives us 12 outs. And of course, we're not going to fold for half pot size bet. And of course, we just completely bonk out. Um, and the fish just barrels three um, donk bets into us. So that's unfortunate. But if it checked to us with a draw like that sandwiched in between two opponents, where we're not sure how much fold equity you have, we can also check back rather than see bet. We don't have to see bet. We can check back and try to realize our equity for free on the turn. Um, interesting. Two four suited, two four suited, both of them in the small blind. I'm going to call because this opponent looks to be really weak, the short stack. I don't expect them to raise too often. Here we're going to fold. We're going to check fold over here. Let's see if we can resize these a little bit bigger and hope that it doesn't freeze up on me. Uh, we're going to fold ace four suited in middle position. And their resizing just is horrendous on their side. Uh, versus MP open, we're going to fold queen jack suited. And look at this, I can't even get into resize the same size. That's okay, we'll just keep it how it is. We're going to fold queen three off suit in the small blind, really no reason to defend. We're going to fold jack deuce suited. This will be open, but it's not strong enough to overcall unless we get an open for maybe cut off, but I prefer just folding anyways. Um, we are going to raise versus an open limp. And we're going to go for value. We're going to go on the bigger side. So I'm not automatically folding here. We have two weak opponents. I'm getting five and a half to one. I'm going to call. It's not the best hand in the world, but I suspect I can outplay them even out of position. And if I make a really strong hand, I'm going to get a lot of value. Four, five, going to go in the muck. King, 10 off. We may defend. And um, I think we check here. So I typically don't put King-10 off in my ISO raising range. And it's really not ISO raise. It's just raising the limper. Uh, this is an interesting flop. It's semi-wet. I'm going to bet half pot size bet. Here we're just going to fold. So the reason for betting the ace-queen off there is that we... ISO raise preflop, so we, so we show a lot of strength. We have a lot of over pairs. Um, our opponent's just going to have a really wide range when they limp, and then they call our limp, or they call our ISO raise with their limp. So they're going to have a lot of, like, you know, just random over cards that are going to have equity in position to us, and it's going to be easier for them to realize our equity. So on a board where it's hard for them to have a pair unless they have an over pair, I just, like, betting half pot there on the flop where people are, are folding too often. Here, this is going to be call. Getting good pot odds, we open. We end up flopping an open ender. We get donked into for two thirds pot size bet. We're gonna fold ace five, which is junk. And uh, with the open ender on the dry board, we're just gonna call. And that's unfortunate. And that's unfortunate as well. So two draws, two misses, but eh, pretty standard. So against two opponents, ace high dry board. I prefer to have a spade, but I am going to take a stab at it. This is purely exploitative. Um, I don't recommend you do this on regular tables where people are calling too often, but when we can represent the ace high and people are just playing really tight in these games, I think we can make this play. On a really dry board, when I get a check race here, this guy is obviously going to have like a six, a seven, six, seven, and sets. I don't expect him to have any sort of a draw just because it's really hard for him to have any draw. People tend to play pretty honest at these stakes. 
And on a dry board texture, it's just with an A67 rainbow, it doesn't really make much sense for him to have anything other than two pairs or sets. So definitely don't need to open pocket threes under the gun. Um, I'm going to check against his opponent. He checks back. I'm going to bet half pot size on the turn. Try to make him fold just an ace high. And we get a check raise. Again, against a short stack, I think, again, they're going to be pretty honest. Um, typical Beluga theorem. So he's obviously has a pretty strong hand there. So because of the technical difficulties, we're going to make this video, I think, maybe 30 minutes in length. It's going to be longer than our average video. Um, we're at 19 minutes now, so we'll make it 30 minutes total, and then we'll call it an evening. So for those of you that have, I guess, kind of wondering how progress is going on my book, um, it's going pretty well. I have the first three chapters out of six. Um, I have the drafts done for those for three, first three chapters and they're off for review to several people and so for the post flop section as of right now it's a total of six chapters planned three of them done um those first three combined were probably around i don't know maybe like 80 pages um let's three bet i mean why not I'm getting min raise. We have pocket nines. I mean, do we really want to turn to bluff? I think I'm just going to flat call. Another great flop. Uh oh. And there's the dreaded freeze. So I, I guess we're only going to play 20 minutes because I'm not going to go through this whole process again and restart this. Um, again, guys, sorry for all the technical issues. As you can see, software is really buggy on Ignition, but I took my money off of Globo because I've been playing there a lot rather than writing my book. And I only wanted to keep money on here so I could produce videos in the interim while I'm working on my book. Um, I've been tempted to actually throw money back on Global, and I'm probably going to have to do that for some upcoming videos before I go to Vegas because I'm just not going to deal with this. Um, I was tempted to actually throw some more money on Ignition or on Bovada, um, and then I decided to play one night, and then I started noticing all these issues again. And so I guess that really <laughs> gives me my answer. My answer is nope. I'm not going to put any more money on here. Um, it's just the software just way too buggy right now. So it seems like half of the people, you know, half the people on 2 plus 2 aren't having issues, and the other half are having all sorts of issues. So I really don't know what's going on, to be honest. But, guys, that's going to conclude our very, very short live play session. Um, didn't really go the way I'd like, but it was super short. Sample size super small. Um, if you guys liked it, and if you guys liked the hand history review. I haven't done a hand history review in a while. Let me know down in the comment section. I hope that you guys liked tonight's video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you guys aren't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button down there in the corner. Tell your friends, tell your family members, tell anybody you know that plays poker about my YouTube channel so they can check out all my free awesome poker training content. And like I said at the beginning of the video, if you guys like all the free content I produce here on YouTube, please consider checking out that link down below for my Patreon account. Because you guys can support this channel for as little as $1 per month. And for $10 per month, so long as you support this channel, you'll get free access to all the paid poker courses at Microgrinder Poker School. You'll also get a free copy of my Essential Poker Math book. But without keeping you guys too much longer. I just want to say thanks for checking out my video, for checking out my channel. Best of luck at the tables, and I'll see you guys at the next time I produce a video in about a week or so. Take care.